Okay, I think, are we live? We are live. Looks like we have a total of uh, almost 100 people in the room already. I'm joined here by the lifestyle medicine great Dr. Dean Ornish. How are you doing, Dr. Dean? Great to be here. Thanks for including me. Absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us today, uh, we are joined by Dr. Dean Ornish, who is the president and the founder of the Preventative Medicine Research Institute in Sausalito, California, just north of San Francisco. And he's also a clinical professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, he's the author of not one, not two, not three, but six national bestsellers, including Dr. Dean Ornish's program for reversing heart disease, uh, Eat More, Way Less, Love and Survival, The Spectrum, and his most recent book called Undo It. And today we're going to be learning a lot about Undo It and the basis for the book and uh, what types of transformations that Dr. Dean Ornish has been able to elicit in his followers as well as uh, a lot of research about how to prevent and reverse heart disease using your food as medicine. Uh, today you're going to learn a lot of things. First thing is you're going to learn the four-pronged approach that can slow, that can stop, and in many cases reverse chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes, obesity, heart disease, hypertension, high cholesterol, depression, anxiety, and a whole bunch more. You're also going to learn why people who feel depressed and people who feel isolated are three to ten times more likely to get sick than those who have a strong social network. And most importantly, if you are one of those people, what you can do about it. You're also going to learn, uh, you're going to understand the role of diet and exercise in disease prevention and disease reversal. And you're going to discover how to turn healthy changes, small changes on a daily basis, into habits that stick in the long term. So, did I say anything there incorrectly, Dr. Ornish? Oh, looks like you're muted. Sorry, one second. There we go. That there we go. Yep. I've written seven best-selling books, but that's okay. Close enough. He's written seven best -selling. How dare I say only six? What's the seventh that I didn't include there? Uh, the one that you mentioned there, the new one. And the okay. very next book I wrote, which is called Stress Dive in Your Head. Okay, fantastic. I should get my facts straight. <laughs> it's Hollywood version. <laughs> okay, so we have a total of uh, almost 400 people here. We're expecting a packed house today. Uh, so if you have a specific question that you'd like Dr. Dean Ornish to answer uh, during this Q&A, um, please write your Q&A or your, your question in the Q&A box in Zoom. So you'll see on your screen there's a place where you can click and then you can ask a question. We have a team in the background who's going to be reading all through these uh, questions and we're going to try and get to uh, your questions at the very end for sure. Um, but before we go any further, I want to know about you guys. Who are you and where are you from? So in the chat box, please just tell us uh, what's your name and where are you coming from? Because it's always important to us to understand uh, what type of audience we have and uh, the more responses we get, the better. I see these responses are starting to come in now. Got Toronto, Canada, Natalie from Tennessee, New Mexico. I officially cannot read that fast, so I'm not even going to try. It is amazing how quickly these responses come in. It's crazy. Okay, cool. So keep thoughts coming in. Okay. Now, here's another question I want to ask you guys. Uh, it's always important for us to understand where you are in the process of transitioning to a whole food plant-based diet because our ulterior motive is to help you guys achieve your best health. And we know through almost 100 years of scientific evidence that the way to achieve optimal health is to transition to a whole food plant-based diet as, as close as possible. So if you currently eat a plant-based diet, please type the number one into the chat box. If you are not plant-based, please type the number two into the chat box. And if you're somewhere in between, type, I don't know, 1.5. And let's see. Looks like we got a lot of ones, a lot of 1.5s rolling in. We definitely have some twos as well. So my, I cannot read this quickly, but if I had to take a guess, it looks like Dr. Ornish, we have about 50% of people are already plant-based, and right. then maybe, I don't know, 20% of people are in the transition towards a plant-based diet, and then the other 30% are not plant-based. Cool. Does that make Okay, cool. All right. Um, so for those of you who, go, who don't know who I am, my name is uh, Cyrus Kambada. Uh, I have a PhD in nutritional biochemistry. 
Uh, I myself have been living with type 1 diabetes for 15 years, and I transitioned to a low-fat plant-based whole food diet back in 2003 when it was not cool at all. Uh, in the process, I've been able to uh, reduce my insulin use by more than 40%, uh, and I've been able to uh, bring down my average blood glucose as measured by your A1C value into a non-diabetic range. Um, I am also the co-founder of a company called Mastering Diabetes, and we teach people living with all forms of diabetes how to transition to a plant-based diet. Uh, today, I'm going to be your webinar host. Um, but before we get started here with Dr. Dean Ornish, and he's got a lot to say, um, I want to take a real quick minute here to share uh, one of my favorite things from the Forks Over Knives team. Uh, the Forks Over Knives team, uh, the ones that are responsible for putting on this webinar today, uh, they have an ulterior motive as well. And their ulterior motive is just to make people as healthy as possible. And I know it may sound funny, but that's ultimately what they're all about. And so, uh, they, you know, just like Dr. Ornish, they strive to help people make the transition to health. And they want to do it in a very simple and easy and affordable way. Uh, one of my favorite tools from them is this online meal planner tool, which maybe you have seen before, maybe you haven't seen before. Uh, but I've been using it myself, and I've been recommending it for all of my clients living with diabetes as well. So I'm going to show you guys what this is all about. And then at the end of this, we're going to go directly into learning from Dr. Ornish, the lifestyle medicine legend. So if you guys can give me one second here, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, hopefully you guys can see my screen here. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of run you through how this meal planner works and we can take it from there. All right. So let me show you exactly how this meal planner looks like on the inside because it's really cool. The first thing that you're going to do is create an account. It's completely free and there's no credit card required to try a free week. Simply select how many people the plan is for and whether you have any food intolerances or not. I don't, so I'm just going to say no. Uh, signing up takes just a few seconds and it doesn't require a credit card. Uh, there's also a handy getting started video at the beginning, which will give you a more in-depth overview when you first join. The first thing that you're going to see is your meal planning dashboard. Every week, the chefs at Forks Over Knives will send you a five-day meal plan with recipes that can all be prepared within 35 minutes or less. You can also add an optional sixth or seventh day if you want. What I love about this meal planner is it's fully customizable. So let's say I'm going to be away from home on Wednesday, so I won't be cooking. Uh, I can therefore simply click to remove the pasta primavera. And if I'm not really feeling like this seven layer taco dip, I can swap it out. I can also type in the foods that I have in my fridge, like tomatoes, lentils, and carrots. And yeah, I want this lentil bolognese. In fact, I want to have that on Tuesday and I want to have the tabbouleh for lunch on Wednesday. So I can just drag and drop to swap these things around. Now, the wonderful thing about the meal planner is that it actually auto generates my grocery list and my weekend prep cheat sheet. So in the grocery list, what you can do is check off items that you already have at home. Then you can access the meal planner when you're on your phone or when you're on your tablet at the grocery store, and you can even add your own ingredients to this list as well. Now, when it comes to the weekend prep cheat sheet, I think this is actually what sets this meal planner apart from all the other meal planners that are available right now. Here, you'll see that the weekend prep will guide you through batch cooking, through baking, through freezing, and everything that you're going to need for the week ahead. So that it greatly simplifies your food preparation and it saves you money. The weekend prep uh, is, is super helpful and it is, again, the thing that sets this meal planner apart. You can, in one click, uh, print out a PDF and you can take this with you if you prefer to have paper. Uh, there's lots more to explore in the meal planner. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, but this is hopefully just gives you a taste of what this can do. Right now you can save 20% off of a premium subscription, but you have to sign up in the next two days. Uh, there's no better time to try. This is 100% risk-free, which means that you can request a refund at any time if you, in the first month, if it's not working for you. Uh, so simply go to forksoverknives.com slash loveplants, and you can score your on 20% off your membership today um, by starting there. Fantastic. All right. So now that we have an official packed house, we got almost 500 people here. Uh, I want to turn it over to Dr. Dean Ornish. Uh, you may know him as the doctor who convinced President Bill Clinton to switch to a plant-based diet uh, following Bill Clinton's quadruple bypass surgery back in 2004. Uh, you, he's also famous for his lifestyle medicine approach to treating heart disease. Uh, Dr. Dean Ornish has directed revolutionary, and I do mean revolutionary research, proving that, proving 
that lifestyle changes can often reverse the most common and costly chronic diseases of our time. Uh, in today's webinar, Dr. Ornish will discuss his personal health strategies outlined in his new book, Undo It. Dr. Ornish, it's great to have you here. Can you tell us about your new book? Yeah, thank you for that kind introduction. I hope I can live up to it. Um, <laughs> so I, one of my favorite quotes is from Albert Einstein. This is what I opened the book with. Uh, he says, if you can't make it simple, you don't understand it well enough. And having been doing work in this field for over 40 years, my wife Ann and I, who we've been working together now for more than 20 years, decided to synthesize everything that we've learned in all these years of doing it into a way that's very simple and accessible. Uh, my favorite key on the computer has always been the undo button. I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had one in our lives? And, and now we do. And the other part is I studied yoga and meditation for over uh, 40 years with an ecumenical spiritual teacher named Swami Satyadananda. And he, he liked to make puns. And people say, what are you, a Hindu? He'd say, no, I'm an undo. <laughs> so the title is in some uh, homage to him as well. And we also present uh, what is really a radical unifying theory. And that is that I was trained, like all doctors, to view heart disease as a very different disease than diabetes or prostate cancer or breast cancer or Alzheimer's or other chronic diseases like that. But the theory that I'm putting forth in this new book is that they're really not different. They're really the same disease manifesting and masquerading in all these different forms. And I say that because they all share the same underlying biological mechanism, things like chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in the microbiome, in your telomeres, in your gene expression, in your uh, angiogenesis and apoptosis and chronic overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system and changes in immune function. And each one of these biological mechanisms in turn is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have, or to reduce it to its, its simplest form, to eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Boom, that's it. And the more diseases we study, and the more underlying mechanisms we look at, the more reasons we have to explain why these simple changes are so powerful, and how quickly people can get better. And I know there's a trend for a lot of people to say, oh, you know, we're not all alike, and you need to personalize a diet, you need to personalize a lifestyle program, and, and that's actually not what we're finding to be true. I mean, if you're looking at a targeted immunotherapy for a particular type of pancreatic cancer cell line, that's awesome. But for the vast majority of chronic conditions, in the 40 years of doing these studies, it wasn't like we found there was one set of diet and lifestyle recommendations for reversing heart disease, a different one for diabetes or prostate cancer or whatever. It was the same for all of them. And again, because they're really the same disease manifesting in different ways. And it's why you often see that the same person will have several of these at the same time, what are sometimes called comorbidities. They'll have heart disease and diabetes and high blood pressure and high cholesterol and be overweight and so on. Or in, in, like in China, in the Colin Campbell's landmark China study, or in what was called the Nihonsen study, looking at people in Japan who moved to Honolulu, who moved to San Francisco, you find the same patterns that even though they have the same genetic diversity that we have, they, you know, 50 or 60 or 70 years ago, heart disease and most of these chronic diseases were as rare there as malaria is here today. They were almost non-existent. And yet when they start to eat like us and live like us, then they all too often die like us. And now that's the number one cause of, of premature death throughout the world. Um, you know, more money is spent for treating type 2 diabetes and heart disease in virtually every country in the world than AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. And it's diverting a lot of resources away from things that really do require drugs like AIDS, TB, and malaria to things that could be largely prevented or even reversed by changing lifestyle. And what's good for you is good for the planet. You know, what's personally sustainable is globally sustainable. And so we talk in the book about, you know, when you make these choices to eat a, a whole foods plant-based diet or even just a meal that's like that, it imbues those choices with meaning because it's not only good for you, it's good for the planet, it's good for feeding the hungry. You know, it takes 10 to 14 times more resources to make a pound of meat-based protein than plant-based protein. There's a, no one need go hungry. I, I live in the Bay Area where you know, it's one of the more affluent parts of the country. And one, I, went, I went on the board of directors of the San Francisco Food Bank years ago, and I learned that one out of five kids here in the Bay Area goes to bed hungry every night. It doesn't have to be that way. And so, you know, you, all of these forces converge to finally make this the right idea at the right time. And I think our unique contribution has been to use these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove the power of these very simple and low-tech and low-cost and often even ancient interventions. And so we were able to show for the first time that heart disease, which was thought once you had it, you could only get worse, maybe more slowly, but that was about as good as you could get. We were able to show for the first time we could actually reverse it. And within a few weeks, the angina or chest pain 
uh, when, it, when it went away in most people. And they not only felt better, but they were better. The measures of direct blood flow to the heart showed significant improvement in just a few weeks. The heart was able to pump blood more normally. Even severely clogged arteries became measurably less clogged. And over a five-year period, we found that there was even more reversal after five years and after one year. And the more people changed, the more they improved at any age, which is a very empowering message to give people. And then we found that these same lifestyle changes could help people get off their cholesterol-lowering drugs, their blood pressure medications, their diabetes medications, as, as you've talked about so eloquently. Um, you know, when most people get put on these meds and they say, doctor, how long do I have to take these? What does the doctor usually say? Forever, right? And usually when I lecture, I, 40 years ago, I had this cartoon drawn of doctors busily mopping up the floor around the sink that's overflowing, but nobody's turning off the faucet. And to me, the real guiding principle of all of our work is to treat the cause rather than literally or figuratively bypassing it. And when we do that, which to a large degree are the lifestyle choices that we make each day, you know, eat well, move more, stress less, love more, that our bodies often have this remarkable capacity to begin healing, and much more quickly than we had once realized when we can treat the cause. And because these mechanisms are so dynamic, it reframes the reason for making these changes from fear of dying, which is not sustainable, to joy and pleasure and love and meaning and feeling good, which really are. You know, there's no point in giving up something that you enjoy eating unless you get something back that's better and quickly. And because these mechanisms are so dynamic, most people feel so much better so quickly. It really, it's not about living to be longer, it's about living better. It's not about, you know, telling somebody that if you don't change your lifestyle, you're going to get a heart attack or a stroke. You know, for a month or so, they'll, they'll maybe do it. And then they stop doing it because it's just too scary to think something bad's going to happen to you. So people tune it out. It's, you know, what happened, I think, with global warming is people just, you know, they just hear it so often, they just tune it out. But what really makes sustainable change is if it feels good. And one of the, uh, the uh, scenes that I write about in the new book in the first chapter is from a film called Game Changers that uh, James Cameron and Luis Ayoyos did. Uh, James became a uh, vegan about nine years ago. He and his wife, Susie, um, I wrote the foreword to her new book, uh, One, More, one Meal a Day, which is based on the same idea. Just if you can't be a vegan, just, you know, have one meal a day uh, or you have a meatless Monday. Whatever you do, to the degree you do it, there's a corresponding benefit. But he made a film, uh, he, he, went, he went vegan initially for environmental reasons, for ones we were talking about. And he began to feel so much better, have so much energy. He's making, uh, we visited the set of uh, the new Avatar movie he's doing. Uh, he's doing actually Avatars 2, 3, and 4 at the same time because he's got so much energy. And he made this film called Game Changers because, as you know, one of the biggest mis misconceptions about eating a whole foods plant-based diet is that you're a wimp and you don't get enough protein. So he has all these elite athletes who... And he, and he did it with Luis Ayoyos, who got an Academy Award for his amazing film called The Cove, which is about uh, the dolphin slaughter in Japan and reduced the number of dolphin slaughter by 97%, which showed him how documentary films really can make an impact. And so he made this film called Game Changers, which has uh, all these elite athletes who became Olympic medalists and mixed martial artists, national champions and heavyweight boxing champions and bodybuilders and, and uh, Rich Roll and people like that to show that it actually makes you stronger and gives you an advantage when you eat that way. And I was one of the medical experts in the film, I met Louis. And um, anyway, there's this great um, scene in the film where there's a urologist named Aaron Spitz and they give a, a single meat-based meal to a group of three guys, obviously elite athletes and they're probably in their, in their mid twenties. And they use this device to measure the frequency and the duration, I mean, the, the frequency and the hardness of erections that they have at night. It's a normal thing for guys to get erections. And, um, and they found that after a single meat-based meal compared to the next day they gave them a single plant-based meal, that they had three to 500% more frequent erections after the plant-based meal and 10 to 15% harder erections. If apparently the, the plant crew uh, went on a, a plant-based diet, I mean the film crew went on a plant-based diet after shooting this scene. You know? And it really shows again, that it's not about doing something today that, you know, to prevent something bad from happening years down the road. That's really not sustainable. But when you realize that your sexual organs get more blood flow in the same way that Viagra works, your brain gets more blood in the same way that, you know, you can actually grow so many new brain neurons, your brain can get measurably bigger in just a few weeks, you know, and think of those parts of your brain that you want to get bigger, like your hippocampus that controls memory. A lot of, the, the, you know, people losing like, as the, their ability to think clearly as they get older, like, you know, what we're, what was that person's name and where did I put my keys? A lot of that may be reversible. And you're actually the hippocampus, that part of your brain that controls memory can actually get measurably bigger in just a few weeks to a month or so. Your skin gets more blood. So you look, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years younger. I'm, I'm 96, I think I look pretty good. Um, <laughs> and, um, 
your, uh, your sex organs get more blood flow, your heart gets more blood flow. So everything works better. And so it really reframes the idea that what we found in able people to make sustainable changes is not fear of dying, it's joy of living. And also when you choose not to eat certain foods and you choose to live, live a healthier life, uh, it imbues those choices with meaning. You know, uh, one of the things my, my wife Anne likes to ask people is like, why do you want to eat healthier? Why do you want to, you know, change your lifestyle? They say, well, I want to live longer. She'll say, well, why do you want to live longer? And they say, gosh, no one's ever asked me that before. You know, there's this kind of assumption, this tacit assumption that everybody wants to live longer. But I was suicidally depressed when I was in college. I came very close to doing myself in, probably about as close as you can without actually doing it. That's how I got interested in doing this work, uh, because it helped me so much. And um, having survived that, it really creates a lot of, uh, uh, of compassion for that. But what I, if you told me when I was depressed, like to me, that's one of the real epidemics in our culture now is depression. Uh, telling someone who's lonely and depressed that they're going to live longer if they just eat healthier, meditate or exercise doesn't work that well because they say, I'm just trying to get through the day. You know, there, there's the real epidemic, I think, in, in our current world is loneliness and depression and isolation. Uh, with the breakdown of the social networks that used to give people a sense of love and connection and community. You know, 50 years ago, most people had an extended family they saw regularly. They had a job that felt secure, that they got to know their fellow employees for 10 years or more. They had a, a neighborhood with three or three generations of people living together. They had a church or a club or a synagogue that they went to regularly. And many people today don't have any of those. And st as you indicated at the beginning, study after study has shown that people who are lonely and depressed are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely from virtually all causes when compared to those who have a sense of love and connection. Really. And so bringing people together is healing. You know, even the word healing comes from the root to make whole, and yoga comes from the Sanskrit to yoke, to unite, or union. These are really old ideas. Authentic intimacy. You know, and one, one of the things that happens is when you grow up in a neighborhood with three generations of people, they know you. They don't just know your Facebook profile or your bio sketch. They know where you messed up and you know your demons and your dark side and you know that they know and they know that you know that they know and they're still there for you there's just something really primal about being seen i mean even in, in jim kimmer and film avatar it's like i see you you know it's which is really from an african problem i see all of you not just your in fact one of the studies i quote in my in our new book is uh that the more time that people spend on facebook the more depressed they are because it's not an authentic intimacy everybody's posting what they think is their perfect life it looks like everybody has this perfect life but me, like what's wrong with me, you know? And so part of what we're trying to show people is that even the stress management techniques and so on aren't just about managing stress. You know, the ancient, you know, swamis and rabbis and priests and monks and nuns and imams and so on didn't develop these techniques just to unclog their arteries or have better erections or do better in sports or whatever it happens to be. They're really powerful tools for transformation, for quieting down our mind and body to experience more of an inner sense of peace and joy and well-being, which is really what it's all about. And the Swami that I studied with, you know, he'd say that, you know, these, you know, we're born with a state of ease. Our natural state is to be easeful and peaceful and happy. But we don't realize that. And so in one of the perhaps the great irony of life, we run after all these things that we think are going to bring us what we could have already if we just stop doing that. You know, hence the undo idea. You know, and, and once you, and the whole advertising industry really gives us the message that, you know, if you're not feeling good, if you're feeling depressed or sad or lonely, you got to get something, you know, buy this or do that. You know, and if only I could have whatever, more money, more power, more beauty, more accomplishment, you know, you fill in the blank, then I'd be happy. Then I wouldn't feel so stressed. Then I'd feel good. Then people would love me and I wouldn't be so lonely. Now, once you set up that view of the world, however, it turns out, it generally turns out badly. Because until you get it, you feel bad. If someone else, then you feel stressed. If someone else gets it, then you feel really stressed. And even if you get it, it's great for a little bit. It's like, ah. Yeah, I'm happy, except it usually doesn't last. It's usually followed soon by either now what, it's never enough, or so what, big deal. It doesn't really provide that lasting sense of meaning. So at the end of a meditation, and when your mind's more quiet, to realize that the meditation or the yoga or whatever it is that you're doing as a spiritual practice didn't bring you that sense of peace. You already had it, but at least temporarily it helped us to stop disturbing what's already there. And that may sound like, you know, semantics or parsing out words, but it's really has profound implications because if I have to get something outside myself to be happy and healthy, then everyone and everything that I think I need has power over me. But if it's me, you know, disturbing my own innate sense of health and well-being, I can do something about that. Not to blame myself, but to empower myself, because then I can do something. And so we, in the book, we talk about not only 
the physical aspects, the psychosocial, the emotional, and the spiritual dimensions, which I think are, are all interrelated. And when we work at that level, we find that people are much more likely to make and maintain lifestyle choices that are life enhancing than ones that are self destructive. The other thing that happens is when you quiet down your mind, you begin to hear your own inner wisdom, your inner guru, your inner guide, the still small voice within, the God within, whatever name you give to that. There's a part of us that knows, so that's very intuitive. In fact, all of the studies that we've done over 40 years, knock on wood, have succeeded. And it's all because I listen to that little inner voice. So it's the one that wakes us up at three in the morning and says, hey, Dean, listen up, pay attention. You're not doing something that's in your best interest. And I've learned to, you can actually dialogue with it. So at the end of a meditation, when your mind's more quiet, you know, ask that little voice to say hello to you. I know it sounds a little flaky, but it actually, most of the time, or to communicate with you in some way. It may just speak to you, it may be symbols, it may, whatever, you'll understand it. And then I ask it uh, as a matter of routine, what am I not paying attention to that I need to pay attention to? And then I just listen. And it's amazing what comes forth. And it's a very powerful way. And then you can learn to trust that voice because it's coming from within you. In fact, all of the research studies, as I mentioned, came from that place. And then I just reverse engineer a study and see if we can, if that's true or not. And, and, and so far it has been. We're doing a new study now, <clears throat> which we started about oh, a couple months ago, three months ago now, actually four months ago. Uh, to see whether these same lifestyle changes could reverse the progression of men and women with early stage Alzheimer's disease. And if anyone's watching this, I and mean, you live in, or you know someone who lives in the greater San Francisco Bay Area who may have early Alzheimer's disease, uh, go to our website. It's just ornish.com or pmri.org. And um, it, 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 we're doing this new study. It's all done at no cost to the participants to see if we can show this. And you know, since there are no good drugs either for treating or for preventing Alzheimer's, if we can show this, you know, when you lose your memories, you lose everything. My mom died of Alzheimer's and she was brilliant and watching her mind decay was really tragic. And so I'm at higher risk as well. So I have a personal interest in this. But since there are no good drugs for treating it or preventing it, if we can show that lifestyle changes can actually reverse it, that'll be a, an important contribution. And I think we're at a place with Alzheimer's very similar to the way we were with heart disease 40 years ago when we started doing studies there, that there's Every, there's studies showing that less intensive interventions may slow the rate at which you get worse. We think a more intensive intervention might actually reverse it. And the other final thing that happens when you begin to quiet down your mind and body is that you begin to experience the sense of transcendence, that on one level, we're separate. You know, you're you and I'm me, and we can enjoy having this, this fun dialogue. But on another level, we're part of something larger that connects us all, whatever name you give to that. And, I mean, even to give it a name is to limit what's essentially an ineffable, uh, limitless, infinite experience. And the teacher that I had used to say, talk about the benefits of having a double vision, that you can see the duality and the oneness, that you like to make analogies. It'd be like the movie, an old style movie projector that the light comes through the film as it goes through the projector and it creates all these great dramas and things that we can enjoy. But if we can also remember the light behind the projector, then we don't get caught in those dramas. And in turn, if we can lead uh, even more productive lives without getting stressed and, and sick in the process. So again, we're trying in this book to go to as far back in this causal chain of events of what causes us to be sick or well, what causes us to be happy or sad, what causes us to be peaceful or agitated, and work at that level. And then we find that, you know, I think the biggest obstacle to lifestyle medicine is this pervasive belief that, oh, you know, it has to be a new drug or a laser or something really high tech to be powerful. And, you know, that the idea that these simple lifestyle changes can be so powerful across so many different chronic disease conditions, not only preventing them, but also in, often in reversing them, is really a hard idea for many people to grasp. And I think, again, by using these high-tech state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost and often ancient interventions can be, it can really empower people. And so that's why, after doing this work for more than four decades, Anne and I are so passionate about doing this work because, you know, it really gets us out of bed every day to put stuff out there, just like what you're doing, Raising awareness is always the first step in healing. So we are grateful to share this, and at least we hope that at least part of it's been uh, useful. This is fantastic. So, okay, uh, I, I really like what you're saying here about um, there's a strong connection between your lifestyle choices and the health of your brain, right? Whether we're talking about conditions like anxiety and depression or whether we're talking about more advanced uh, conditions like cognitive decline, like dementia and Alzheimer's disease, which usually take years to, to initiate. So, you know, uh, from what I understand, there's, there's multiple ways to improve your brain health. You can do it by changing the foods that you're eating, and you can also do it by adopting a more mindful practice to yeah. quiet your, your mind down 
and yeah. like you said, achieve more transcendence. Um, and and uh, love and uh, stress management and yoga and meditation, all of them. By the way, all the all good, I wanted to show a, a short video of a guy just to show again how powerful these lifestyle changes can be. Uh -huh. This is a guy who is a doctor himself and he had such a massive heart attack that he was told that there was so much damage to his heart, the only thing that would keep him alive is to get a new one, to get a heart transplant. It's about as radical as you can get. And so while it, it takes a while to get a donor, someone usually has to get killed on a motorcycle or whatever. So while waiting for a donor, he went through our program uh, for reversing heart disease. After 14 years of review, Medicare uh, began, created a new benefit category to provide coverage for my reversing heart disease program. So we've been training hospitals and clinics and physician groups around the country. And it's working. We're getting bigger changes in lifestyle, better clinical outcomes, bigger cost savings, and better adherence than anyone's ever shown. It's really amazing. So one of the sites we trained is at UCLA in Los Angeles. And so this guy went through our nine-week reversing heart disease program to get in better shape for his heart transplant. But he improved so much that he didn't need a heart transplant anymore. So you tell me what's the more radical intervention here, you know, a, a heart right. transplant or eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Not to mention that it saves a million and a half or $2 million to whoever would be paying for that, whether it's the insurance company or Medicare or the doctor. And you have to take, uh, you know, immunosuppressive drugs the rest of your life. So this is a little four minute video that I put together. Uh, I'm just going to play it for you and hopefully it'll work. For sure. And I mean, this example is just one of thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have also gone through the same process by transitioning their lifestyle to a, a more sort of whole food plant-based approach, right? That's right. We have, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people that have gone through our program. So let me, uh, Play this one. Go for it. My wife and I were having a very vigorous, full, robust life with uh, working full time and enjoying our kids and enjoying uh, the environment that we're in, which is up in the mountains. And, and then uh, one day on October 29th, 2015, we were both in a near fatal head on collision. Unfortunately, uh, the next day, I had a cardiac arrest and uh, quite literally passed away. And the process of regaining consciousness was an agonizing, prolonged climb out of a dark, empty void. I heard my wife's voice call me back. And I was able to will my consciousness back to her. And that's uh, really when our journey started. I found myself alone and caring for him. Until the heart transplant workup, where Dr. Boss came into the room and said, you know, there's one last thing that you could do. So the kind of chest pain I was having was the kind that makes you afraid to get out of bed. I was afraid to sit up without someone helping me. I was afraid to walk to the bathroom because I was afraid every time I got chest pain that that was... That, that was the end, literally. My ejection fraction dropped to uh, somewhere between 11 and 15 percent. Normal is uh, generally considered to be over 50 percent. Mine was down to 11 to 15 percent, which made me unable to, to almost move or get out of bed or walk or do anything without some assistance. I was immediately dizzy, short of breath. My blood pressure would drop with every exertion. And immediately I said, let's do it. This is, yes, it's a diet. Yes, it's lifestyle changes, but it's something that we can do. Let's give it a try. As my husband was just going, you know, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Yeah, I really didn't think it was going to work. And uh, I heard that there was, you know, yoga and some other things and an 11 infection component, which, which frankly sounded, sounded corny at the time. I would say within about 10 weeks, I started seeing incredible results. To, to my astonishment, after a few weeks, the engine has started to improve.
all of a sudden his chest pain is getting less and less. Um, we moved from down here in our home. We couldn't, he couldn't go up the stairs. We went back into our own bedroom, which was huge. He was going up the stairs. Um, the weight started to come off. Well, I would say no matter what anyone tells you, it works. Can't argue with success. And here we are today. My husband went from dead men walking to taking strolls on the street and taking our dog for a walk at 6,000 feet. I'm grateful. We look at the before and after pictures of me, the pictures of me after the heart attack. As, as a physician, I've seen many dead people who look much better than I did. And it's not an exaggeration. I look ashen and gray and, and washed out uh, and cachectic at some points. Uh, and now, arguably, uh, I feel as good as I have had at any point in my life. And as long as you truly love your spouse, you will do anything to make them better. Anything. <laughs> I'll even let him take my lipstick off. Can you believe this is my wife? <laughs> I love it. That's a super touching video. That's great. And yeah, like we said, you know, you, you've been able to promote lifestyle change for tens of thousands of people, you know, in a similar position, right? They've been diagnosed with heart disease, high cholesterol, hypertension, angina, you name it. Uh, and so there's actually a lot of questions here specifically about cardiovascular health sure. uh, and the cancer as well. So let's get into them here. So it might be uh, worth mentioning just to quick, do a quick overview, but we've also found that the same lifestyle changes can change in genes. We published a study with Craig Venter who was the first to be part of the human genome, that over 500 genes were changed in just three months when people were on our lifestyle medicine program, turning on the good genes, turning off the bad genes. You know, so often, and even you mentioned President Clinton earlier, when, when his bypass is clogged up, his cardiologist, one of his cardiologists held a press conference and said, oh, it was all in his genes, his diet and lifestyle had nothing to do with it. And having been working with it for many years, and it had everything to do with it. So I sent him a note and, and told him that, uh, you know, he could actually reverse it if he made bigger changes. And to his great credit, for the last nine years, he's been on a whole food plant-based diet and, and making these lifestyle changes. And whatever your politics, I think when a former uh, president uh, makes these changes, it sets a great example for everyone. And we also did a study with uh, Dr. Peter Carroll at UCSF and Dr. Bill Fair, when he was chair of urology at Memorial Sun Kevin Cancer Center in New York, that these same lifestyle, lifestyle changes may slow, stop, and even reverse the progression of men with early stage prostate cancer. And what's true for prostate cancer is likely to be true for women with breast cancer as well. We did a study with Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering uh, telomeres, the ends of our chromosomes that control how long we live. Uh, they're like the plastic tips on the ends of a shoelace. Uh, they keep the shoelace from unraveling, they keep our DNA from unraveling. And as we get older and the DNA replicates, it tends to get shorter. And as the telomeres get shorter, our lives get shorter, the risk of premature death from heart disease and diabetes and most forms of cancer and Alzheimer's goes up proportionate to that we found for the first time that we could actually lengthen telomeres when people made these lifestyle changes. Their telomeres got longer, about 10%, whereas they got shorter in the control group. And when the, the Lancet, one of the uh, premier international medical journals, uh, when we published those findings, they, they sent out a press release worldwide and they called it reversing aging at a cellular level. So again, the more diseases we study and the more underlying mechanisms we look at, the more we understand why and how these simple lifestyle changes can make such a powerful difference in our health and our well-being and even in our survival and how quickly that can occur at a fraction of the cost. And unlike most things we do as doctors, the only side effects here are, are good ones. Okay, so this is great, actually. Let's go into cancer a little bit here. There's two questions that have come in while we've been on this uh, webinar so far. Uh, the first one is um, from William. He says, I'm a huge fan of your work. And is it safe to say that animal products uh, cause cancer? So according to the World Health Organization, processed meat and red meat cause cancer. But what about things like chicken, fish, eggs, and dairy? That's question number one. Question number two uh, is what about soy products? Because there's, you know, there's a lot of information on the internet about the fact that when you consume soy, it increases, it could potentially increase your risk for, for breast cancer and prostate cancer. Is that true? Well, let's, let's try to take the questions one at a time because uh, it, it'll be easier that way. 
Sure. Uh, probably the soy question, just to start with that. Um, soy actually helps protect against breast cancer and prostate cancer because uh, estrogen stimulates cell growth and proliferation, which unrestrained is what cancer is. And um, the way the confusion is, is that um, soy products, again, we're talking about organic soy and preferably fermented soy products, really the, the best, are high in what are called phytoestrogens. And phytoestrogens look enough like a, an estrogen molecule that they'll bind to an estrogen receptor. But it's kind of like putting a key in a lock that'll go in the lock, but it won't open it. It'll bind to the receptor, but it, it, doesn't, it only weakly stimulates it. But it keeps the regular estrogen model, m- molecule from binding to it. Because if you imagine you had a key that went into a lock, but it wouldn't open it, but it keeps the regular key that would open it from going in there, the net effect is actually to decrease the effects of estrogen, not to increase it because it's actually blocking the estrogen effects. I mean, if you had a huge amount of soy, theoretically you could get to the point where you could overstimulate it, but for the amount that most people would eat in a diet, it actually is protected because it actually decreases the effect of estrogen. And the other question was? It was about chicken, fish, eggs, and dairy. So, you know, I debated Dr. Atkins a number of times before he died and his autopsy actually showed that he died of uh, heart failure. And he was a low carb guy, so I got kind of pegged as the low fat guy. But it turns out that getting past this whole low carb versus low fat debate, that animal protein itself may play an even more important role. And, um, and Walter Willett actually did a, uh, a survey of several hundred thousand people in the physician's nurse, nurses study, the, the Harvard physician study, the Harvard nurses study. And he found that processed meat was the worst, followed by red meat, followed by chicken, followed by fish, in terms of it's increasing the risk of, of uh, prostate, breast, colon cancer, and, and other and heart disease and other conditions like that. There was another, another study that came out in a journal called Cell Metabolism, where they found that uh, people who ate a lot of animal protein had a 75% increased risk of premature death from all causes, and a four to 500% increase of risk of premature death from heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and prostate, breast, and colon cancer. So um, when you go from a plant-based diet, from a, a meat-based diet to a plant-based diet, and I grew up in Texas eating meat all the time, um, you get a double benefit because you're not only not eating the things that promote cancer, but you're also getting hundreds of thousands of substances that are protective, that help prevent, have, have, have any cancer, any heart disease, anti-aging properties, things like phytochemicals, bioflavonoids, carotenoids, retinols, isoflavones, genesine, lycopene, there's only 100,000 or more of these. And where do you find them? You find them primarily in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and soy products. Okay. This is, this is fantastic. So it's, it's funny because I think uh, your average person gets a little bit confused when they go on the internet because, you know, if you type in, does soy cause cancer and you just get bombarded with so many different conflicting. Well, a lot of doctors get confused. I'm on the nutrition committee of the American College of Cardiology and we published a paper last year where we said, how much nutrition training does the average doctor get? And it turns out it's four hours per year. Right. And how much nutrition training, and even that's like, you know, vitamin C and scurvy, you know, that kind of stuff, that level. And we said, how much nutrition training does the average cardiologist get in four years of fellowship? And it's zero. <laughs> you know, we couldn't leave it. You know, I mean, that's so, it's easy for people in general public to get confused. It's easy for a lot of doctors to get confused because we don't, unfortunately, we don't get that. And one of the reasons that I wanted to spend 14, that I ended up spending 14 years for uh, Medicare to finally cover our program, for which we're deeply grateful was because if you change reimbursement, it changes medical practice and even medical education. We're starting to see that. That's now finally beginning to change. I love it. Absolutely love it. Okay, and so anyway, Cindy. Way, one last thing. And that's yeah. why I spend so much of my time doing scientific research you know, with some of the top people in the world because that's the whole point of science is to help cut through all these controversies. You know, one person says this, one person says that. You know, and say, okay, let's actually measure it and see. And you know, still the only diet and lifestyle program that's been scientifically proven to reverse heart disease in randomized trials is the one that we've been talking about. Um, you know, and one of the diagrams that I put in our new book and the Undo It book uh, is from the New England Journal of Medicine where they show what happens if arteries on different diets. On a whole foods plant-based diet, the arteries are clean, there's no blockages there, the blood's flowing through very nicely. On a standard American diet, which has the great acronym of SAD, um, they're partially clogged. And on a Atkins, high carb, low protein, ketogenic, you know, paleo, whatever the latest iteration of that is, diet, the arteries are severely clogged, even if they may lose weight or, or benefit in risk factors. And so that's why I think it's really important to, to look at really what happens on different diets, not just to 
weight loss, because you can lose weight in lots of ways that aren't good for you. You know, amphetamines are a good way to lose weight. Smoking cigarettes is a good way to lose weight. Even therapy is a good way to lose weight, you know. Um, but that lose weight in ways that enhance our health rather than ones that harm it. Agreed. Yeah, especially in the world of diabetes, like I was referring to earlier, is that people are always uh, enticed by the idea, you know, they get to get this carrot dangled in front of them and says, I can teach you how to lose weight. I can get your A1C down. I can get your blood glucose nice and flat. You know, but that just because you can adopt a low, low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet and get those results does not mean that in the long term that you're actually improving your or decreasing your risk for chronic disease. Right. And as you know, the, the biggest, the, the, the most common complication, uh, fatal complication of diabetes is heart disease. 100%. And, and so the, the reason why all these diets are seductive, whether it's the Atkins or keto or paleo or whatever, is that they're based on a half truth. And the half truth is that most Americans eat too many refined carbs. Yeah. No doubt about it. And so if you eat less of that, you're going to benefit. But even better is to eat less, less refined carbs and sugar and, and less animal protein and more fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes and so on as they come in nature, which are high in fiber, not very dense in calories. The so fiber slows the absorption of the food. So when you go from, say, brown rice to white rice or whole wheat flour to white, white flour, you're removing the fiber in the bran that ordinarily fill you up before you get too many calories. But it also slows the rate of absorption from your gut into your blood. So instead of getting these wide spikes in blood sugar, which then provoke your pancreas to secrete insulin, which can cause chronic inflammation and a lot of these other problems, uh, you get a more constant slow rise. And so you get the benefits of being on a ketogenic or an Atkins or a paleo diet, but you're enhancing your health rather than, uh, rather than harming it if you reduce not only the simple carbs, but also the fat and the animal protein as well. Okay, got it. Got another question here from Cindy. Uh, she says, I've been on a whole food plant-based diet for over a year to help reduce my cholesterol levels. My blood pressure has gone down considerably. However, in a most recent lipid panel, my cholesterol has almost doubled. Uh, specifically, my triglycerides are so high that they couldn't even be calculated. The only thing that I was doing was taking, in addition to a whole food plant-based diet, was taking red rice yeast, but then I discontinued that. So what the heck is going on? You got any ideas? Yeah, I do. I mean, again, I never seen or talked with or seen this person's record, so I can only talk about this in the abstract, not with this particular person. But in the abstract, uh, red rice yeast has an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase uh, inhibitor, which is the same uh, substance that you find in, in statin drugs like, uh, like Crestor or uh, Lovastatin or things of that sort. It's medical. Now, yeah. When someone's triglycerides go up, some people have what's called a type 4 hyperlipidemia, that they're more sensitive to the effects of dietary uh, refined carbs like sugar and white flour and white rice and alcohol, which your body converts to sugar very quickly. And so for someone who has found that their triglycerides are going up, you can eat a, a, a plant-based diet that's not very healthy if you're eating a lot of refined carbs. You know, Twinkies are vegan, you know. Uh, and so I would imagine that this person is eating a lot of, of refined carbs. And if he or she would cut back on that and eat food more as it comes in nature, avoid the processed food, avoid the refined carbs, avoid the sugar, high fructose corn syrup, alcohol, increase exercise and do these other things. Then we found the average triglycerides go down significantly. If they're going up, it's because generally a person's getting too much refined carbs. Okay, fantastic, that's super helpful. Uh, next question, how much fat should a teenager eat? Is it different than the amount of fat that you would recommend for an adult to eat? Well, you know, uh, if you don't have a chronic disease, you can eat a little more fat. It's not that big a deal, uh, but not as much as what most people eat. And again, why would you want to eat less fat? Well, first of all, if you're not old, if you're a teenager, the last thing you're worried about is dying of heart disease because you think you're immortal anyway. And so the only reason for eating a plant-based diet is, number one, fat has nine calories per gram and protein and carbs have four. So when you eat less fat, you're going to eat fewer calories, even though you're eating the same volume of food. And so it's the easiest way to maintain or lose weight because, um, you know, you're, you're not having to reduce the amount of food, but just change the type of food. Also, it makes you feel better and look better in ways we talked about earlier. So um, I would be less concerned about, you know, more plant-based sources of fat if someone is a teenager. And often they're growing quickly. They're uh, often expending a lot of uh, energies, particularly if they're doing any kind of school athletics and so on. And so having a little more oil or more avocados or seeds and nuts and so on. And I think seeds and nuts, even though they're high in fat, even for people with heart disease, in moderation can be beneficial because outweighing the fact that they're high in fat is that they're, they're germinant, they're no seeds, they're, they're, they're gonna grow things. And although we don't really have a way to measure that in Western science, they have a germinative quality to them. You know, it's like they're bursting with life that's about to 
to come forth. And I think through mechanisms we don't fully understand, but we certainly know that people who eat nuts um, uh, in moderation actually do better even than those who don't. Absolutely. Nutrient density. Uh, Steven asked a question. He says, I have hypertension and I was 20 pounds overweight when I discontinued all alcohol and I went 100% whole food plant-based. Uh, can you give me some guidance here as to how long it should take or how long you would expect it to take for my blood pressure to fall? I'm 30 days in and my blood pressure doesn't seem to have changed very much. Okay. Well, it usually changes very quickly. I remember the very first study that we did, we were going to, I had 10 men and women with bad heart disease. This was in 1978 uh, in a hotel for a month. And we were going to keep all their medications constant because we didn't want to change that. And we actually had to reduce to get people off of their blood pressure medications in most cases because their blood pressures were getting so low that they were, uh, you know, they were getting dangerously low and passing out. And again, it shows that for most people, even though they're told that they have to be on these medications to lower their blood pressure or their blood sugar or their cholesterol level, and they have to take these drugs forever, if you're willing to, it's like, how long do I have to mop up the floor? You know, we have the sequence of the floor that we talked about earlier, forever, why don't we turn off the faucet? And when people make these lifestyle changes, their blood pressure usually comes down. Again, don't make any changes in your medication without doing it under your doctor's supervision. Just suddenly stopping taking your blood pressure pills can be dangerous and even life-threatening. But under their monitoring, and one nice thing about blood pressure is it's easy to monitor, uh, you, most people can reduce or get off it. But the diet's only part of it. You know, emotional stress causes your arteries to constrict. That's part of the fight or flight response because if you're about to you know, get into a battle with some uh, soldier or a lion or a tiger, you want your arteries to constrict and your blood to clot faster because if you get bitten or wounded, then you don't bleed as quickly. But you know, it's part of the reason why, excuse me, uh, it's not enough to just focus on diet because when your arteries constrict, then the pressure goes up. It's like a garden hose. If you constrict the nozzle, the pressure comes up with that. Uh, the same is true when you exercise and when you meditate and when you um, have more love and support in your life, your blood pressure will go down too. So after a month, you should start to be seeing some benefits. And if you're not, I would ask somebody to really look at what you're eating, but also to incorporate the other three aspects of our program as well, because they all play an important role. That's a great response. I love it. Uh, Mark says, my cardiologist is recommending an aortic valve replacement due to stenosis. Uh, I've recently been eating the way that Forks Over Knives recommends. Uh, is there hope for people like me um, to improve the condition of valves um, in the same way that you can improve arterial health? You know, there isn't a lot of literature right now showing that lifestyle changes can reverse the stenosis of an aortic valve. I mean, the reason why people get an aortic valve replaced is either they're too tight, they're not opening all the way, or they're not tight enough and there's leakage. Uh, and so it's hard to know exactly which condition you find yourself in. But if it's, you know, if it's leaking, then that's really more of a mechanical problem. The good news is that the new techniques of replacing aortic valves by just putting a, a, a tube in you as opposed to having to cut your chest open make the procedure much less of, a, of, a, of, a, of, an, of an issue in terms of the long-term recovery from that. Whether or not you know, the calcifications that may keep an aortic valve from opening can be changed, we haven't seen a lot of that. And so that may be one of the conditions where surgery may be indicated. Yep. Okay, that's very good. Um, uh, another question here about traveling, because you know, eating a whole food plant-based diet when you're at home can be relatively straightforward, and you can develop habits to do so. But then when you're traveling for work or for pleasure, when you're visiting relatives, it can get a little bit challenging. Uh, how, do you have any recommendations for how to navigate that process and then how to also t uh, handle criticism from other people? Yeah, well, if you're with your family, what works really well is just tell them they're horrible people and they're killing animals and you know, they're going to go straight to hell. That's, that's where <laughs> it always works, yeah, no question. <laughs> no, I think the, the best teacher is a good example. And uh, my spiritual teacher, I'd say, I, I would get on my soapbox and he'd say, did they ask you? And I'd say, well, no, but, 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 but did they ask you? <laughs> so mm -hmm. I've learned not to, to, say, to offer anything unless someone asks, and even then to be very judicious about it. Again, if people see that you're looking better, you're more peaceful, to me, what really matters is not, you know, so as one, somebody once said, what, what's more important is not what goes in your mouth, but what comes out of it, you know, and if you can lead a loving, healthy life, uh, then people are going to want to know, like, what did you do? You look so good, or... Gosh, I want to be like you, you know. So uh, avoid, avoid uh, proselytizing. At the same time, you don't, it's not that hard, especially now. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times earlier today about, you know, the new meatless burgers, you know, the Beyond Burger and Impossible Burger and how, you know, their IPOs were going to be, you know, huge amounts of money. And I think Burger King now is going to be 
serving uh, the Impossible Burger as a vegan thing. I, I consulted with McDonald's years ago trying to get them to put healthier foods on the menu. Uh, so now it looks like it's finally happening. Uh, and so that's encouraging. But, you know, if you go out to dinner, you don't have to go to a, a vegan restaurant or a plant-based restaurant or a health food restaurant. You go to just a really good quality restaurant. And then when it comes around to order, you know, say, hey, would you make, ask the chef to pick out their freshest vegetables and just make me a plate of them. You know, try to do it, ask the chef to do it with as little oil and butter and salt as possible. And, um, and, and they just use their creativity. And you'd be amazed what they come up with. And then and you don't have to spend a lot of time. It doesn't have to be like, you know, when Harry met Sally, you know, when Meg Ryan's trying to order the restaurant. It's just like, it's simple. And then uh, you don't have to draw attention to yourself. And then oftentimes your friends will look at your food and go, I didn't see that on the menu. That looks better than what I got, you know? So it's not that hard to do. And the better the quality of the restaurant, the easier it is for them to accommodate. But likewise, if you're going to go visit your friends or family, just say, Maybe a few extra side dishes. You know, that doesn't have to be a big deal. Say that last part, the last five seconds. You got a little muffled as soon as you're saying it. You know, and like when you're visiting your family, just say, make me a few extra side dishes. It doesn't have to be a big deal. Got it. Very cool. Okay, yeah, I think you're right. This is, uh, you know, it can get overly complicated, but, you know, uh, without, you know, I think a lot of people who transition to a whole food plant-based diet feel the need to have to tell the world and proselytize, like you are saying. And if you just kind of keep it a little bit more inward, then you can avoid a lot of conflict in the, it's, in the like that, it's like that old joke about how, how can you tell if someone is vegan? He's like, you don't have to, they'll tell you. <laughs> they'll tell you, exactly right. Um, okay. Here, so sorry, well, for the record, all of the recipes in my new book are vegan, just so you know. Okay, that's great to hear, actually. Uh, Amy, very simple question. What food is so nutritious that you recommend eating it every single day? Is, does such a thing exist? Oh, I don't know. There's so many. I, I think it's, I, I try to get away from um, reductionistic thinking in any, whether it's in science, where they say, you know, just have, just change exercise only. Don't do all these things at the same time. You know? And my attitude is you get a synergy when you do a lot of things at the same time. It's more than just the additive value of it. So there are a lot of uh, healthy foods out there that are plant-based that uh, I don't want to focus on any one of them because uh, uh, it, there's no magic bullet out there. It's really the whole symphony of foods that really makes a difference. Got it. Yeah, I think that's a great response, actually, because this reductionist uh, mindset can be kind of, you know, it can get dangerous in the long term. But, you know, if you think about it, it's, it's like you're eating a cornucopia of whole food plant-based, uh, you know, meals, then, you know, individual isolated foods become less and less important because they get diluted in a large, uh, in a large collection. Exactly. Um, uh, Margo asked a really good question. She says, uh, as a 66-year-old kidney transplant recipient of almost four years, I want to be as healthy as I can to keep this precious kidney transplant from uh, functioning over the course of the rest of my life. Uh, right now, I'm eating a whole food plant-based diet, and I'm also on uh, powerful immunosuppressive medications as I have to be the rest of my life. Uh, do you have any recommendations for those of us, those of us who have had organ transplants um, and may not be able to get off of these immunosuppressive medications um, to stay as healthy as possible? Yeah, well, I appreciate the question. And, you know, um, when people go on immunosuppressive drugs, it has a, one of the side effects is that it accelerates the rate at which your atherosclerosis or blockages build up in arteries throughout your body, including in your kidneys. And so it makes the reason for going on a, a diet, a whole food, not just a whole foods plant-based diet, but basically a, a, a near vegan diet that's very low in fat and refined carbs because that's the diet that we found can actually reverse and therefore prevent the uh, blockages from building up in your, in your precious new kidney. Uh, and also, it's a lot easier for your kidney to detoxify a diet like that. It doesn't have to work as hard to, to get rid of plants and, and as it does in a meat-based diet. Uh, I, I, in fact, um, some people who needed dialysis when they were on meat-based diets, uh, if they weren't too far gone, were able to get off that because their own kidney began to work more effectively. They weren't, they weren't asking to work as hard when they change their diet. So for both protecting it from a vascular standpoint and also from asking it to do less work, uh, what you're doing makes a lot of sense. 100%. We've seen people, uh, you know, who have, as far as stage three kidney disease, make a full reversal to completely normal kidney function just by changing their diet. So it's definitely, uh, definitely possible. Uh, Henry asked a good question. He says, what are your thoughts on mammograms? I've read recently that they uh, may be unnecessary and could actually be harmful. Is this true? No, I'm not the most qualified person to answer that question. Um, but it is ironic that when they do too many mammograms, particularly the older machines that have higher radiation, they can cause the very thing that they're trying to detect early. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's put it in a larger context. I think that's something that you really need to ask your, your doctor about because they, 
most uh, uh, doctors who give mammograms are much more up on the latest literature and how much radiation their devices are, are doing and what age they should best be done. But remember, mammograms don't prevent breast cancer. They just help you find it sooner. And so if you really want to talk about preventing breast cancer, then we, we come to the diet and lifestyle choices that we've been talking about. Perfect. Great response. Uh, uh, somebody asked, says, does transcendental meditation have any advantages over other forms of meditation as far as improving your uh, chronic disease risk? No, it doesn't. Transcendental meditation uh, is a good form of meditation, but there's nothing unique about it. Um, you should, it, med meditations are like exercise. If you like it, you'll do it. Find a mantra that you like, find a way of meditating that you like, find a teacher who um, resonates with you and your soul uh, and do that. But meditation is really um, the easiest way to do it. I mean, I can just teach people now in 60 seconds how to meditate. Let's do it. Meditation is just the practice of bringing your mind to one thing, and it can be anything. But traditionally, certain sounds have been found to be very soothing, and they gen tend to be sounds that start with an O or an A, and they end with an M or an N, like OM is the more classic one, or Shalom, uh, or Salam, or Amin, or Amen. They're often words that actually are translated to mean peace. Or even the word one has been found to work just as well. It has that same beginning kind of with a vowel and ending with an N. So pick a word, and when you close your eyes, you take a breath, and then you hum it. I mean, it's, you know, if you've ever had a kid and holding a kid and your baby in your arms, you know, you start humming to it. It's almost an intuitive thing. And so you would close your eyes, take a breath, and say, just use the word one just to keep it secular for the moment. Just say, one. So you run out of air and do it again and again and again. It's nothing more than that. Now, you may think, why in the world would I want to sit and do that when I've got a thousand things on my to-do list? And the answer is because it's one of those powerful things that you can do. And it's one that most people have the most preconceptions about and misconceptions about because it looks like you're not doing anything. You know, at least when you're exercising, you know, you're really out there doing something and you have to eat. It's just a question of what. But meditation is something you actually have to do that's not part of most people's routine. And yet studies have shown that something simple as meditation can um, change your gene expression in hundreds of genes. You know, Jeff Dusick at Harvard did a study that showed that. And so when you meditate, your mind quiets down in the way that we talked about earlier. You begin to experience more of an inner sense of peace and well-being, a sense of transcendence, a quietness that allows you to access your inner voice. And so the way to do that is just repeat the sound, like one, till you run out of air, take a breath, do it again, and do it again, and over and over for a minute, or five minutes, or 10 minutes, or 20 minutes. Now, what will invariably happen is your mind will wander. Everyone's mind wanders. The Dalai Lama's mind wanders, just not as much as mine does, you know. And so when you become aware that you're not thinking about the sound, that you're thinking about something else, don't beat yourself up. Just gently but firmly keep bringing it back to the sound over and over again. And over time, you'll find that your mind wanders less and you get better at concentrating. So whatever you do, when you can focus your attention better, whether it's in sports or school or business or whatever, you, you, do, it, you, you do it more well than you had before. Um, you know, whether, and also on a purely sensual level, whether it's food or sex or music or art or massage, when you really pay attention to something, it's more sensual. You get more pleasure. In the case of food, if you eat mindfully, like really focus on what you're eating. I love chocolate. So you get a little small piece of really dark chocolate, close my eyes. You know, you can spend several minutes and it's an ecstatic experience and you're getting relatively few calories as opposed to, you know, eating while watching a movie and you kind of look down and like, who ate that? You know, you didn't even got all the calories and none of the pleasure. It's the same with Anything sensual, when you really focus on it, it's more sensual. You enjoy it more. You get more pleasure with fewer calories in the case of food. And so when you meditate, you get better at focusing. And anytime you can focus energy, you gain power. Also, you begin to get deeper in your brain waves, and, then, and that gives you an even deeper sense of, of, of uh, healing than you get even during sleep. So one of the easiest ways to meditate is just to get up five or ten minutes earlier than you normally do. It's usually quiet then. You know, People aren't asking you for stuff. No one's calling that early. And just go downstairs or go in the other room and meditate for five or ten minutes. That's what I do. And the, um, the improvement in, in the restfulness that you get from doing that more than makes up for the five or ten minutes of sleep that you didn't get. So there's really no net cost to you in that sense. And it sets a tone for the rest of the day that people say things like, you know, I used to have a short fuse and I'd explode easily. Now my fuse is longer. So you can kind of go through the day and be buffered by a lot of the stresses that you otherwise might be feeling. And so you can accomplish even more without getting stressed and without getting uh, sick in the process. I'm sorry. I was meditating the whole time. Could you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
This is actually really, really fascinating because it, just like you're saying, you know, um, you know, quieting your mind down and taking a sort of more mindful approach can really be one of the most simple strategies, one of the most simple exercises you do all day long. It's just that it's become so foreign to us in this world of constantly being bombarded with information and having to analyze things and respond to things. And so, you know, just taking a small a couple of minutes every single day to do this can actually make a profound impact. Yes. Uh, Mar Marlene asked, she says, my husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's after having been on a plant-based diet for over a decade. Uh, do you have any advice? Have you ever heard of this? Well, I certainly don't think a plant-based diet causes Parkinson's, but that's the implicit question. Mm -hmm. Whether or not it can actually help it is an area that some people are studying. We're looking at Alzheimer's disease, but there's a certain amount of overlap between the two, so we'll find out. Okay. Very good, very good. Uh, okay, a couple more questions here. Uh, how often can or should someone with a bad calcium score um, get another scan? Uh, are there other tests to take, uh, or, is a, uh, or is this the best uh, test to determine the, uh, the amount of atherosclerosis that you've built up over the course of time? No, a calcium scan is, uh, is more of a screening test. And if you have a high calcium score, then you need to have another test to find out because it's not the calcium that really causes heart attacks in most people because that's stable. It's literally calcified. It's the, the soft plaque that may not show up on, on a calcium scan that can sometimes get what's called plaque hemorrhage and turn from a 30% blockage to 100%. Uh, those are the ones that are more dangerous, and those are the ones that improve the most when you change your diet and lifestyle. So you may not necessarily see an improvement in your calcium score, even though your heart disease may be reversing, because it's the soft plaque that's reversing, which turns out to be the most dangerous part of the, of the lesion anyway. So there are ways, um, depending on how high your score is and other factors, you should talk with your doctor about having what's called a, uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's an angiogram, but it's not done by putting a tube all the way up into your heart. It's a, where they just inject some uh, dye into a peripheral uh, blood vessel, and it's what's called a CT angiogram, where they can actually show not just the calcifications, but the entire plaque, the soft plaque, and all of it throughout your body. It's really like something out of a science fiction movie. It really shows how much, how much plaque you have throughout your whole, uh, all the arteries in your heart. And then that becomes a great baseline. Then you can then repeat that after some period of time to see whether that's getting better or not. There's a certain amount of radiation exposure with that, so you, that's why you need to talk to your doctor to see if the potential benefit offsets the risk. But um, if you really want to know whether you're getting better, that would be the way to do it. Okay, last question from Catherine. She says, do you think that genetics are ultimately more powerful for pre disease prediction and disease reversal than is your diet? No, I don't. I mean, there is a... Small number, one in a thousand people have a homozygous combined, uh, I mean, a homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, for example. Uh, and maybe, you know, a somewhat larger number have uh, heterozygous. But even then, lifestyle plays an important role. Uh, but our genes are a predisposition, but our genes are generally not our fate. Uh, this goes back to the discussion I talked about earlier in this podcast with, about President Clinton, who was told it was all in his genes, and it's not. And we, as I mentioned earlier, we published a study with Craig Venter, who was the first to decode the human genome, showing that over 500 genes were changed in just three months, turning on the genes that keep us healthy and turning off the ones that cause us to get sick. And so, you know, a good lifestyle can override bad genes in most cases. Uh, and, and at any age, you know, when I began doing this work, I thought that the younger people with less severe disease would do better, and I was wrong. It turns out it wasn't how old or how sick or how genetically, you know, disadvantaged someone was. It was simply a function of, the more they ch changed their lifestyle, the closer they followed our program, the more they improved and the better they felt, and the better they felt, the more they wanted to keep doing it because then it really, they could say, oh, when I, they connect the dots between what they do and how they feel. It's like, oh, when I eat this way, when I meditate, when I exercise, when I love more, I feel good. My angina goes away. I can walk across the street without getting pain. I can make love with my spouse. I can play with my kids. I can go back to work. That's worth more to me than, you know, eating a burger, you know, and, and you literally connect the dots between what you do and how you feel. And because it comes out of your own experience and because these mechanisms are so dynamic and how quickly you can feel better, that's really what makes it sustainable for most people. And so let me just say in closing that, uh, you know, having spent most of my adult life now, over 42 years doing these kinds of studies, um, the, the, the single most, the, the best thing that you can do for yourself and for the people that you love is to eat a whole foods plant-based diet that's naturally low in fat and sugar and refined carbs and things like that meditate and do some other simple yoga techniques 
walk or do some kind of exercise that you like, some kind of strength training and some kind of uh, aerobic exercise. And spend more time with the, with the people that you love, you know, with your friends and family and loved ones. That's not a, a luxury to do after you've done the important stuff. That is the important stuff. And when you do that, it will not only help us live longer, but it will help us to use the experience of suffering as a doorway for really transforming our lives to the point where so often people say things to me like, you know, I mean, having a heart attack was the best thing that ever happened to me. The first time I ever heard that, I thought, what are you nuts? And they said, no, that's what it took to get my attention to begin making these changes in my diet and lifestyle that have made my life so much more joyful. I'm rediscovering inner sources of peace and joy and well-being. I'm more connected intimately with people that I care about. I can do things I couldn't do before. I feel better. I look better. You know, I taste better, whatever. Um, and for many people, you know, they can look back on, I mean, for me, it was getting suicidally depressed. That was my door. For someone else, it might be a, being overweight or a chronic disease of some sort. But if we can then use that as the opportunity for helping people to transform their lives, because, you know, change is hard. But if you're in enough pain or you're not uncomfortable, then the people are more interested in change. And then instead of just numbing it or bypassing it to say, okay, let's use that as a doorway for really transforming our lives and learning how to love others and love ourselves and rediscover, uh, rediscover and experience inner sources of peace and joy and well-being and lead a loving, more compassionate life, that's a really good thing. And that's why I love doing this work so much. This is great. So how, how can people get their hands on your new book? What's the best way to do it? Amazon? Amazon. And, uh, I like going to your local bookstores is always a good idea too. It's, it's available in most places. They uh, still have bookstores? That's a thing? <laughs> I know that's a <laughs> And if you go to our website, which is uh, Ornish, my name, O-R-N-I-S-H.com, everything on there is free. A lot of the studies are there. Uh, the sites that are offering our program are there. And uh, it, there's a link to the Alzheimer's study that if anyone's interested in learning more about that. So... You know, to me, awareness is always the first step in healing, as we talked about earlier. So thank you so much for the chance to uh, share this information, and I hope that some of it's been useful. 100%. Uh, if you guys are still here with us, for all of you who are, could you please give Dr. Ornish a big thank you in the chat box? Uh, he's, I mean, I don't think I've ever said this before in my life, but thank you for four decades of incredibly detailed hard work. Thank you. <laughs> it's really, really, really impressive. I've read so many of your studies, and every time I read it, I just get this little tingling inside of me that says, this man discovered the answer a long time ago, and he's doing one heck of a job trying to teach the sort of traditional medical model how to incorporate uh, lifestyle change that actually does truly work. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, my uh, wife, Ann, who co-wrote the book with me, is as brilliant as she is beautiful. And there's a nice yin-yang quality to the male-female uh, dialogue that we have in the book. I think it works better than either alone could be. So I hope you enjoy it. Fantastic. Will do. Uh, and um, for those of you who are still with us right now, remind uh, just a quick reminder, you can save 20% off of your uh, Meal Planner membership if you choose to become a premium member. Visit forksoverknives.com slash loveplants. Uh, the Meal Planner is sure to knock your socks off. Again, I've recommended it to thousands of people, and I always get a lot of people give us really, really, really good feedback on how it simplifies their life, saves them time, and saves them a ton of money. Uh, Dr. Ornish, thanks again. Uh, we'll hopefully see you real soon. You too. Thanks again. All right. Okay.